Stephen Key here. Guess what? We're on our next adventure, the Lake Titicaca. Am I pronouncing that correct? I'm not quite sure, but it's gonna be a great time. Please join us. This adventure. <coughs> hey, Stephen Key here and Janice. And guess what? We're on our next adventure, heading off to where? We're at Lake Titicaca, an amazing name to be sure, and we're going to visit the floating islands today. These islands are built completely on reeds and they float on the water. We're going to meet the indigenous people who live there, see some local customs, and eat local food. Clearly Janice does this much better than I do. Of course. So, so stay tuned. <laughs> All right, here are a few fun facts about Lake Titicaca. It's, what's that, 100 miles long and how wide? 37. Oh, that's a big lake. And it's how high? We're above 13,000 feet, <laughs> which makes it the highest navigable lake in the world. There are other lakes, maybe up in the Alps or, you know, in high mountains, but they're, they're small. Uh, they're just little alpine lakes. And this one is very large and so it can be boated yeah. on and used for transportation and, and fishing and all that stuff. And very cold too. Definitely. Okay, Stephen Key here and today I'm going to talk about how to negotiate a winning licensing agreement and of course I'm at Lake Titicaca in Peru. Okay, you've done everything right. You've made that sell sheet. You created a great product that a company wants. And now you're waiting for that licensing agreement to come on, come on over to you so you can start negotiating. But I'm here to tell you, negotiation starts way before you get the contract. And most people don't understand that. And let me try to explain. Number one, the way you file your intellectual property and the way you structure your intellectual property has a lot to do with leveraging a winning licensing agreement. Also, your marketing material is extremely important too. How it looks and how it, how it feels and if you've taken away, well, not taken away, but let's say you've got a strong point of difference. And then the third thing is identifying the right company to reach out to and making sure you're in the right category, which there are a few, hopefully more than a few, inventor and friendly companies. So your negotiating licensing agreement starts very early on, not when you actually get a licensing agreement. People ask me all the time, how did I learn to negotiate so well? Well, first of all, as you know, I started my career selling uh, things I made at street fairs and county fairs and state fairs. Um, all through um, California, and I learned a lot about people. I learned a lot about um, how to negotiate. The other thing I wanted to mention, people always ask me, well, Steve, how did you learn to deal with these big companies now um, when dealing with these licensing agreements, especially when they're so so large and, and technically you're a little bit smaller than they are? I, I tell everyone, it's called survival one-on-one, -on -one, trying to get paid. That's how I learned. Most of the people, well, in the United States, are really not comfortable with negotiating any type of uh, contract or even, you know, even bar, you know, doing a little bartering back and forth at a flea market. They're just not comfortable with it. But you have to learn to have a good sense of humor. You have to learn to leverage your strength so you can get the best possible deal. And most people are just not good at this. But I'm going to give you a few tips uh, to make it easier for you. Here's the first tip I'm going to give you. And we see this actually all the time. When a licensing agreement does come over, it has the company's name, the licensee, but the licensor, which is you, is, is actually sometimes in your name and should never be in your name. It should be in some type of business entity. And I prefer an LLC personally because you need to protect your own assets. Okay, a licensing agreement is gonna take a long time. And some of the issues are pretty straightforward. 
And if you're working with a company that's done a lot of licensing agreements, it's, it's a little easier, let's put it that way. If, if, if you're working with a company that's never done a licensing agreement, it's gonna be a little bit more difficult. Um, here's a tip. If they ask you, the licensor, the inventor, to supply a licensing agreement, tell them no. It never works out well it, because they really need to know what they need to be successful. So the licensee needs to write the own con their own contract, and it's going to be awful when that first come when it first when the first time it comes over, and most likely it's going to be a boilerplate. They're kind of testing you to see how much you know. And even though you've talked on the phone or maybe you've gone through email on some of the issues, when you first see that boilerplate, it's going to be so ugly, you're going to want to run. But it does get better with a little bit of time, a little bit of experience. You can change most of the terms in your favor, or at least get it balanced. There's going to be many hard issues to negotiate. And I'm gonna go through with just a few of them. I think one of the hardest things to negotiate or, or basically comes up in a lot of contracts and we're seeing a lot of it lately, is that the company wants to own your intellectual property in exchange for a royalty rate. And then later on in the contract, they wanna be able to control the filing of that intellectual property. But also in that contract, it states that they don't have to file at all if they don't want to. Well, that's a big conflict because here they're saying that they wanna uh, own the intellectual property, but then they're saying that they're gonna take care of it. And then they say, basically, we don't have to do anything. That's a huge problem. And you need to negotiate out of that situation or you're gonna end up maybe with intellectual property, of course, that you don't own. And guess what? They don't do anything with it. And guess what? You don't get paid. All right, here's another issue that comes up all the time. Improvements, there's going to be improvements. I can guarantee it. And most of the licensees want to own all those improvements. Here's the problem. If they own those improvements and for some reason the contract breaches and you get it back, you're going to have to either license those improvements from the company and that could present a big problem. All right, here's another issue. Let's say somehow someone um, infringes on your intellectual property. In some of these contracts, your licensee wants you to defend it you do you never want to be able to or have to or be required to defend any type of lawsuits that could get extremely expensive it should be balanced you should have the option if you want to defend it or not or they should have the second option if they want to go forward or not so don't get boxed in that you have to defend your intellectual property it could be extremely expensive and you're not going to like it <laughs> Here's another thing I see in licensing agreements all the time. The company, of course, wants you to file intellectual property and they list all the countries they want you to file it in and, and, and you're required to file it in all those countries. Holy smokes, that could get extremely expensive. What you want to do is stay away from, from this contract, this licensing agreement that really states um, that it's all about patents, it's all about claims. You want to make it broad enough. It's really about your product. You want to license your product, not your intellectual property. Indemnification, this is really interesting. Typically, both sides want to indemnify each other. In other words, a company is going to indemnify you over any type of loss or any type of exposure financially. And they should because they're doing all the manufacturing, selling, and distribution. But when they want you to indemnify them, if there's a third-party lawsuit, that's asking quite a bit, especially because you're only collecting a royalty, so you have to negotiate around that term. Audit clauses, I see them all the time. Sometimes they're pretty vague. There needs to be more clarification. Uh, typically, you can audit them once a year, but if there is a discrepancy, they usually pay for it, then they'll pay for the audit, and sometimes they'll even pay um, the interest on, on that money. So make sure you have an audit clause that s specifies all these little details. Don't make it too vague because they try to make it very vague. Insurance, they have to have insurance and you wanna be named on the policy. 
it's pretty standard. All retailers require insurance. So if there's no product liability insurance, make sure it's in there and you're on the policy and make sure it's, it's in the millions of dollars. <laughs> get the highest royalty rate I hear this all the time you can but you have to have a few things in place you have to take a little bit of risk away and negotiate a higher royalty rate but there's one thing I heard from Richard Levy famous toy inventor and he told me one of the best ways of getting a higher royalty rate just ask minimum guarantees yes you need a performance clause to make sure to make sure they're selling your product it has to be in there if you give someone an exclusive, which all the companies want, and there's no minimum guarantees, guess what? They don't have to sell one. They completely own it without selling one. So you have to negotiate minimum guarantees. Most companies hate this. There is a strategy to this. Huh, it takes a little bit of time, but make sure there's some type of performance clause and I prefer minimum guarantees, and that's related to sales. Bankruptcy clause, oh geez, if you're dealing with a company, potentially, especially a small company that can or potentially can go in bankruptcy, you better have some good language in there that states that they, if they go into bankruptcy, they have to give everything back to you. That breaches the contracts so you don't get caught up in court with some licensing agreement with some company that you can't get it back. And here's one of the last things. A lot of these contracts don't have definitions, and I don't really like that. Definitions really make it very clear what the words mean. So if you can, make sure your licensing agreement has definitions with all the terms. As I said this before, this is not easy to do, and I've been doing it for over 30 years. So you're going to need someone. If you need us, contact us, but make sure you have someone that knows the business terms and before you sign any licensing agreement, make sure you have a licensing attorney review it. I believe you do it at the very end so you can save some money, but you're going to need someone that can help you because this is not easy. Like I said, I've been in over 30 years and it's still difficult for me. I'm currently writing a book on, um, it's called One Simple Idea, How to Negotiate a Winning Licensing Agreement. And if you're interested, when that comes out, please send me your, your email and I'll make sure to notify you it's going to take a little bit of time. There's a lot of topics and I'm going to cover every topic in every category and how to, how to negotiate, how to negotiate around those difficult terms so you can come out on top or at least make it a little, uh, pretty balanced licensing agreement. floating island where there's five families that live here and they explain how they build these floating islands. I'm completely blown away. <laughs> what a great experience. I cannot believe I'm here. I'm on Lake Titicaca. I started my career in doing arts and crafts and sculpture and I saw this wonderful piece of, of, a, of a, a young lady on and one of the the boats that they make and i just fell in love with it and here's the artist here and i just have to bring it home what a treasure Jim's 
Okay, we're heading home. We've had a great day on the lake and we've done a lot of things. First of all, we visited uh, an island and we got to meet some amazing people. And also... Well, we had lunch on a different island and it's called Pachamanca. And it's where they cook the food in the earth with hot stones and they cook it in layers. So there were potatoes, on top of that was chicken, followed by fish, followed by bananas. But Janice, just getting to the restaurant, we had to walk through a farm and uh, kind of a cow patty situation well, going we were on. Stepping around some uh, oh. significant items that you wouldn't want to step on. But the food was fantastic, and then we ended up going to this wonderful floating island. And spent some time with the uh, five families on that floating island, and then we got this. There, there's had a special little boat that we took a little ride in. Absolutely, and uh, we saw how they made these floating islands out of cutting reeds and stacking them, how they made their boats, uh, how they used them to hunt birds and uh, collect eggs, and of course go fishing since they live in the lake. Uh, very different lifestyle. But they do have solar panels here. Yeah, and I think they have a cell phone too. I don't know, but there were light bulbs inside there in the tents. So it was an unusual mix of technology and so we had a great, great day on Lake Titicaca, for the name, and we're heading back to the hotel. So thank you everybody for watching this video. Bye.